All right, so we're going to uh, change gears a little bit and talk about syncope, which uh, to me is, is one of the most fun things in emergency medicine. Um, syncope is defined as uh, a transient loss of consciousness followed by loss of postural tone or associated with the loss of postural tone with brief and spontaneous recovery. So patients awake, alert, and normal, then loses tone, falls to the ground, unconscious. Generally, the loss of consciousness has to be very brief because they're hypoperfusing the brain, and then they wake up on their own. So if you have to give an amp a D50, that's not considered syncope. Also, it has to be a brief loss of consciousness. So the patient who says, yeah, I passed out at two o'clock in the morning and I woke up at 7 a.m., that's not syncope either. That's Jack Daniels or, or a methadone, all right? Um, so it's actually fun, and, and you can do a, a fantastically small workup that is completely based on the evidence. The workup can be very, very small, but in the entire workup that you do, you do a very good history, you do a very good physical exam, and it turns out that the evidence supports that the only test that you routinely need to do, unless your history of physical says get a CBC or check their electrolytes, the only test that you should routinely do is the electrocardiogram. And uh, I, I would suggest that you should probably be getting electrocardiograms in everybody I don't want to make anything 100%, but nearly everybody with syncope ought to get a 12 lead ECG. And so in, in the half hour that I have, I'm going to spend a little time talking about what you should be looking for on that 12 lead ECG. Now, everybody looks for these couple of things. I call these the no-brainers. Everybody looks for ischemia, and everybody looks for dysrhythmias, AV blocks and dysrhythmias. That's, that's pretty simple, but there's four additional things that I would suggest that you always get in the habit of looking for. And you can break this down as two genetic things and two intervalopathies, all right? So there's the no-brainers, there's the two no-brainers, two genetic things, and two intervalopathies. And if you simply remember that, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to pick up almost all of your deadly diagnoses that the ECG will reveal, all right? So let's get started and we'll just do these uh, similar to our format yesterday, I'm gonna show you a one-line history and an ECG, and then we'll talk about what we're looking at. So, and all of these are real cases. This is a 29-year-old man who came in to the emergency department after a syncopal episode, and I'll tell you the story behind these also, that a lot of these cases I'm about to present come from an m, &M talk that I put together for our own group many years ago, and this was one of them. This is a, a young guy who is running to catch a bus, and he had a near syncopal episode, he thinks maybe he passed out. He's not exactly sure, but it was very brief. Either way, came to the emergency department, and this was the 12 lead ECG. Any thoughts about what this is? So I'm here out loud. Really? Good. So I'm hearing. So I'm hearing some Brugada, and I'm hearing some Hokum. This is actually hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Brugada is a really hot topic, and so I always start with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, because if I start with Brugada, everybody gets it right. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The story behind this is the patient was diagnosed as pretty much having nothing. He had a normal history, normal physical exam. The EKG was read by the physician, the EKG machine, and by the cardiologist a day later as LVH and old lateral MI because of the QIs in one and AVL. Now, why would a 29-year-old have LVH? let alone why would a 29-year-old have an old lateral MI, but that's often the misread on these cases. The patient had no symptoms, said, Doc, I feel fine, the way most of our syncope patients do when they show up. He got sent home. I met this patient a week later when he was in, when he got brought in in cardiac arrest, and I pronounced him dead. And then I looked back at our computer system and found this ECG from a week earlier, and you can imagine the, the feeling that goes down your spine when you realize that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was, was missed. This is a common miss, though, because most people in emergency medicine, in fact, most cardiologists don't learn how to diagnose this on ECG, all right? The cardiologists that know about this are the ones that write the books. They're the ones that write the EKG books. They teach this in their courses. Most cardiologists learn to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy not on EKG. They learn to diagnose this on echo. We're the ones that are the frontline providers. We're the ones that have to know the EKG findings for this entity. So what are the EKG findings? Very simple. We'll make this very, very simple. The two things that I want you to remember are high voltage. Take a look at how large these QRS complexes are. Sometimes people will look at this and call it LVH. Technically, you're not supposed to diagnose LVH on EKG in people under the age of 40 or 45. 
because a lot of young people just have giant QRS complexes. If you were to get EKGs on uh, a bunch of kids on a high school basketball team, all of them have QRS complexes this big. That's not pathology. That's not LVH. That's just remodeling or is part of having a young athletic heart. So we don't call it LVH because that implies pathology. All right, so that's a little bit of semantics. But when you look at the 12, you're going to see big QRS complexes. So large amplitude QRS complexes, and the other key finding is deep narrow cues in the lateral leads. What are the lateral leads? One, AVL, and V5, and V6. Now, in this per those are the most common. Sometimes you'll see them inferior, but most commonly lateral. Now, in this case, V5 and V6 are fairly unremarkable, but take a look at how deep and narrow these are. The other key point is don't mistakenly say old lateral infarction. These are not infarction Q waves. Infarction Q waves have to be at least one box wide and about one third the height of the entire QRS. These are one third the height of the whole QRS, but they're not wide enough. Infarction Q waves have to be at least a box wide. When you see very deep, very narrow Q waves, especially in the lateral leads with high voltage, think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what you do for that patient, send them for a confirmatory test called Doppler echo, easy enough to get, send them for a Doppler echo, and if it's positive, you just saved a kid's life, all right? You just saved a young person's life. If it's negative, you're done, but if it's positive, you just saved the life of a young person who probably would have gone back out there, and the next time they're exerting themselves, they might very well drop dead, as we hear about all too often. So I'm going to show you just a bunch of cases to really hammer home this simple finding. Here's another case, high voltage, deep narrow cues, one, AVL, V5, a bit in V5, and in V6. See how narrow these are. These are not infarction Q waves. Here's another case, high voltage, big QRS complexes, deep narrow cues, one, AVL, V5, and V6. Sometimes they're inferior, but in my experience, most of the time, they're in the lateral leads. And here's another example, high voltage. Sometimes high voltage can screw up your T waves. That's just very nonspecific, but high voltage, take a look at these Q waves. Very deep and narrow in one AVL, and just a little bit in V5 and V6. These are fairly unremarkable, but in this case, one in AVL really give your diagnosis. Here's another example, high voltage, and in this case, not much in one or AVL, but strange deep Q waves in V5 and V6. Here's another example, high voltage, deep narrow cues, one AVL, V5, and V6. Again, there's nothing else that produces Q waves that are very deep and narrow. Here's another example, take a look at this. High voltage, not much in one or AVL, but take a look at these cues, very deep, very narrow. These are like daggers. You can almost imagine OJ hanging onto the end of these things. There's just nothing else in emergency cardiology that's gonna give you Q waves that look like this. So when you see Q waves that look like this in your post syncope patient, send them for a Doppler echo, you're gonna save a young kid's life. All right, the majority of these are gonna be young men, but not always. It can occur in young women as well, but almost always, practically always, there's high voltage, and the key thing you're looking for is deep, narrow cues. Now, you can have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy without the deep, narrow cues, and that becomes very nonspecific. You have to work those patients up purely based on clinical suspicion. But this being an EKG lecture, what I want to hammer home is that when you see high voltage with deep narrow cues in the lateral, in, in particular, in the lateral leads, send the patient for a Doppler echo and you're going to save someone's life just by knowing how to read this finding on EKG, which is not commonly taught. All right. So questions? Yes. Great, great, great question. So what if you can't get a Doppler echo right away? My preference would be to try to get it right away, but in many scenarios, you can't get it right away. Um, what do you do? In that particular scenario, I think it is safe to send them home. And just like you suggested, you tell the patient, don't exert yourself until you get that Doppler echo, no exertion, just be a couch potato. And the one other thing that I would do is I would put them on beta blockers, all right? So we didn't get into the pathophys here, but the primary problem with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is diastolic dysfunction. Most cardiomyopathies have rotten systolic function. These patients have pretty good systolic function. That's how they're athletes. You know, you hear about the high school basketball player or the college football player. They wouldn't possibly be athletes without good systolic function. They've got good systole. It's diastolic function or filling. That's really bad. If you ever want to improve diastolic function, in other words, if you ever want to improve filling, how do you do that? Slow down the heart. Put them on beta blockers. That gives them more time for filling. 
all right? So what you're going to do with these patients in that scenario, put them on low-dose beta blockers, tell them do not exert yourself and get that Doppler echo the next day or within the next couple of days, and the Doppler echo is the diagnostic test. If it's positive, there are some surgical therapies and some medical, but mostly surgical therapies I think are most successful that can help resolve this problem. And the patients have pretty good long lives. If you miss it, there's a decent chance that the patient's going to go out and have that um, that sudden cardiac death the next time they're running down the football field or basketball court or running to catch a bus. All right. Other questions? Yep. Great. So are beta blockers going to mitigate the diagnostic utility of the echo? No. Um, the beta block, because what you're looking for on echo is you're looking for a hypertrophied septum, which will still be there, and then some, uh, some outflow obstruction of the LV, and the Doppler echo should still pick that up. Nice question. There's another hand that went up here. Yep. Exactly. What happens is during times of severe um, uh, catecholamine excess, a catecholamine outpouring, um, what happens is they get a sudden obstruction to LV outflow, cardiac output drops, patient drops, and the patient can then degenerate into a malignant arrhythmia. If they're lucky, the VTAC spontaneously converts back to sinus rhythm, they wake up, and that's called syncope. If they're not lucky, it degenerates from VTAC to VFib to asystole, that's called sudden death. All right, so you see syncope and sudden death are often the same disease along the spectrum of how lucky you are. All right, so we've got to pick up these diagnoses when they're lucky enough to show up after syncope, right? Um, other things that can produce sudden catecholamine uh, excess, usually it's exertion, but anything that causes an abrupt surge of catecholamines, you might be just watching TV and then suddenly something very dramatic happens. You know, you're watching Jaws and then that there's that scene where the shark comes out of the water and you scream. Uh, you know, that can pour out enough catecholamines to have you have your syncopal episode also. So not all of these patients have exertional syncope. They may simply be sitting down watching TV when the syncope occurs if there's a sudden emotional stress or something along those lines. All right. Um, other questions? All right, so what are you looking for on the post-syncope EKG? Everyone's looking for ischemia. Everyone's looking for arrhythmias. We've added hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to the list of things that you always are looking for. All right, what else should we add? Number two, here's a 30-year-old woman who comes in after a syncopal episode. Now she's sitting in front of you saying, Doc, I feel perfectly fine. Diagnosis here. Good, this is the Brugada syndrome, all right? For those people that don't know what Brugada syndrome is, Brugada syndrome is relatively new in the electrocardiography literature. It's first identified in the 1980s. And if you consider that the EKG's been around for well over 120 years, this is really one of the newest EKG entities that's been identified in the world of electrocardiography. It's been out there, and I think a lot of people in emergency medicine and certainly cardiology know about this, but still relatively new. Within cardiology, the most reliable cardiologists who know about this are the electrophysiologists. And that's not in any way intended to be a slam against cardiologists, but the general cardiologists and invasive cardiologists, they're spending their time reading about other things. They're reading about lipids and invasive procedures and stents and platelet playlists. They're not reading the EKG literature. So in my experience, even at a big tertiary care center, the most reliable cardiologists to talk to about Brugada are the electrophysiologists or, you know what, the fellows. The fellows are all over this stuff because they're studying for their boards. The general cardiologists who have been out for a number of years, they don't always know about this. Or the invasive, the cath cardiologists or the hypertension cardiologists or the lipid cardiologists. The electrophysiologists, on the other hand, they live for this stuff. If you ever want to get an electrophysiologist excited, just talk about Brigada. And suddenly, they actually smile. They don't usually do that. Um, but they suddenly actually get excited. I'm convinced that most the electrophysiologists, they dream about this stuff at night. They sit at the dinner table and talk to their kids about Brigada syndrome. I mean, they really get excited about this. And those are the most reliable people to talk to. Well, this was first identified back in the 1980s when the Brugada brothers, so Megan talked about the Brugada algorithm for VTAC versus SVT. Um, there's actually, I think, I think there's three Brugada brothers that are cardiologists, uh, or maybe two, and one of them's a pathologist, but th they've done a lot of studies together. And they had heard about this condition in Southeast Asia where a lot of adolescent uh, boys were having sudden cardiac death. 
It's been around for years and years. They went down there to study it, and it was an interesting thing that these young adolescents who had no prior known cardiac disease or any, any type of disease, oftentimes they did have a family history of sudden cardiac death, would oftentimes, at, at night in particular, just have sudden cardiac death. Sometimes they had syncope and later on had sudden cardiac death. They had autopsies that were completely normal. So this is not a structural problem. There's no coronary anatomy problems. There's no LVH. There's no coronary lesions. This is purely an electrical phenomenon, which the prevailing theory now is that it's some type of sodium channelopathy. But regardless, they ended up studying this. And what they found is that a lot of these patients, a lot of these kids, these young boys, had this unusual EKG pattern at some point around the time of their syncopal episode uh, or at some time prior, preceding their sudden cardiac death. So what is the EKG finding you need to look for? Well, it's very simple. Your money leads here are V1 and V2. It's an incomplete or complete right bundle-ish type of pattern. So you see there's kind of an RSR prime type of pattern. It looks like a right bundle or an incomplete right bundle with this unusual ST elevation in V1 and V2. They originally described it V1, V2, V3. I forget V3. It's not helpful. V1, V2 are your money leads. All right? Now, these patients are usually asymptomatic because they're post-syncope, they're feeling fine now. So you're not going to diagnose these patients as having a STEMI because they're not having chest pain. Usually they're just post-syncope patients. And you're going to see this incomplete right bundle type of pattern up here with this strange ST segment elevation. Uh, there's two types of ST segment elevation. There is a saddle type that you see over here. It's like concave upwards, like a cup holding water in V1 or V2. And there's a cove pattern, which is more either straight or convex upwards, kind of coved or convex upwards, terminating in an inverted T wave. What we now know is that the coved pattern on your right is much more sensitive and much more specific and much more reliable. Some of you may have learned about Brigada type 1 and type 2 and type 3. Just forget it, all right? All I'm going to ask you to remember is these two patterns up here. In particular, the pattern on the right, the coved pattern, is much more sensitive and much more specific. When you see that pattern in a post-syncope patient, you're going to get on the phone and call an electrophysiologist and tell them that you're worried about Brigada. If you only have access to a general cardiologist, hopefully they'll know what you're talking about. If they don't, hang up on them and find an electrophysiologist or your patient will die. I'm not even joking, all right? I'm not even joking because there's still a lot of non-EP folks out there that simply don't spend their time reading about this. And this is not intended to be an insult to them because they're reading about other things in their specialty of invasive cardiology or lipid or, or, or whatever. It's the EP cardiologists that spend their time reading about this and they, they know about this stuff inside and out. So going back to this case, what happened with this patient, patient came in post syncope and the patient ended up being admitted to the hospital. The emergency physician looked at this, the machine called this a STEMI. And to this date, I've never seen a machine reliably call something Brigada. So you can't rely on your machine. So the, the machine's calling this a STEMI. So the emergency physician said, well, this can't be a STEMI, there's no pain. He consulted the cardiologist, general cardiology, comes down, sees the patient, says, well, it looks like a STEMI, but there's no pain. Tell you what, let's just admit the patient for a routine rule out. So the patient got admitted to the hospital, ruled out by troponins, got an echo, negative. Got a stress test, negative. This is not a structural problem. They could have patient, taken the patient for a cath. It would have been negative. So everything, every, the workup's negative. This pattern is persisting, and they're getting ready to discharge a patient when another physician happened to see this EKG and said, you know, this looks just like that Brigada thing I've heard about. So again, true story, they went to Google Images, <laughs> true story, and pulled up a whole bunch of cases, some of which looked just like this. And so instead of sending the patient home, they transferred the patient across town to university to the EP lab, where they took him to the EP lab and confirmed the diagnosis of Brigada. Now, what do the electrophysiologists do? They take them to the EP lab. Because the prevailing theory is that this is a sodium channelopathy, what the electrophysiologists do is take them to the EP lab and they infuse a very potent sodium channel blocker, usually of which is called something called agmaline. All right, it's not something we use in the emergency department, but it's a very potent sodium channel blocker. One of three things happens when you infuse this medication. Number one, nothing happens. If nothing happens, you just ruled out the diagnosis. Number two, 
the ST segments get a lot more higher and more prevalent, that confirms the diagnosis. Or number three, it just puts the person right into polymorphic VTAC. If that happens, they just shock them out of it and then put an AICD in, and that's the treatment of choice. There are no medications that reliably treat this. The only effective therapy is placement of an AICD, and that's why you've got to get the EP folks on board. All right? Now, you know, I said that um, what happens here is these patients have a propensity to develop polymorphic VTAC, and electrophysiologists are okay with that. They have electrodes in the heart. They can shock them out of it. It's not a big deal. All right? But when these patients out in the field or in the community, when they go into polymorphic VTAC, they hypoperfuse the brain, they fall to the ground. And one of two things happens. Either it spontaneously converts and they wake up, and that's called syncope, or it degenerates to V-fib and they die, and that's called sudden cardiac death. So once again, you see that syncope and sudden death are often the same disease along a spectrum of how lucky you are, all right? If they're lucky enough to wake up and they come into the emergency department with syncope, this is what you've got to pick up because if you miss it, they're going to go back out and the next time they may have that sudden cardiac death and not be so lucky. So let me show you a bunch of more examples to really hammer home this pattern. All of these are post-syncope patients. Take a look at V1 and V2. Now this patient was, again, from my m and case series. This is a patient that I pronounced dead. This patient was seen in the emergency department several days earlier after she had a syncopal episode. And this was diagnosed as just incomplete right bundle, nothing else. That's what the machine called it. That's what the physician called it. The patient got discharged home. A few days later, had another syncopal episode. By the time paramedics arrived, she was in V-fib. They were unable to resuscitate her. They brought her to the emergency department and I pronounced her dead and found this EKG in, her, in the computer from several days earlier. This is about as classic of a Brigada pattern as you get, yep. Is this usually something diagnosed in adolescence or can it be at any age? Okay, great, I'll get to that in just a second. Okay. Think, great question, what ages, all right? So this was actually a 35-year-old African-American woman. The totally wrong demographic, okay? Um, so she's got the incomplete right bundle with oblique ST elevation terminating in an inverted T wave in V1 and V2. Here's another example. This is a patient who came to the emergency department also in cardiac arrest. We got this patient back, but this patient, last I heard, ended up with hypoxic encephalopathy, and last I heard, lives in one of our nursing homes with a peg and a trach and no mental status. This EKG was obtained in her doctor's office a week earlier when she presented after a syncopal episode. And you just wonder if that physician had known about Brigada that her outcome could have been very different. Now, I don't think it's standard of care for primary care docs to know about this, uh, but if you know about this, this is an opportunity to, to save a life. All right. So who, who ends up getting this? Back to your question. This was first identified in adolescent boys as the world of electrophysiology has come together, and there's actually been at least three, I think maybe four international consensus conferences on Brigada during the past 20 years, they now uh, believe that Brigada is responsible. First of all, Brigada has been identified in every ethnic group, men and women, every country. The lowest age that people are talking about it is age two. And so the Brigadas and other peds cardiologists believe this may be a more common cause of SIDS than previously recognized. And the oldest age that I've heard of is a 70-year-old. The oldest age case that someone sent me is a 65-year-old. So it spans the entire spectrum of ages. The average age of diagnosis is around 40 years old. So very different than the Southeast Asian adolescent boy. All right, you have a question? Correct, this was from a primary care doctor's office. What's that? I'm sorry? The patient presented to the primary care doc's office because of a syncopal episode. And this EKG was done. The computer read this as simply incomplete right bundle. That's about it. The primary care physician didn't think much more of it. So let me answer that. That's a great question leading me to something else that's important to mention. This, this Brigada pattern will probably be there around the time of the syncope, around the time of the event. But we also know that the Brigada pattern can come and go, unfortunately. So you can get an EKG from a year ago or maybe a year later and it may be gone. A week later, it may be gone. Nobody exactly knows why that's the case. 
All right? There's still a lot of research being done to try to figure out why it can come and go. Why is it that for some reason a person can go 10, 20, 30 years and then they, they get to 40, 41 years old and then suddenly they start having episodes and the Brigada pattern shows up? Nobody really knows that. What we do know is that it tends to be more prevalent if somebody's on a sodium channel blocker like cocaine or antidepressants and so on. We also know that fever and hot ambient temperature tends to bring the pattern out more. Maybe that's why it's first identified in Southeast Asia near the tropics, right? So hot ambient temperature, nobody really understands why that is the case, right? Um, but if you see the EKG and it doesn't have the Brigada pattern, you're out of luck. But most of the time, if a patient just had the syncope, and that's why they're coming in, you're probably going to see this. Yeah. So if it's an incidental finding. So, sure. So if you see the coved pattern, the more sensitive and more specific pattern, and it's purely incidental, I would refer that person to an electrophysiologist. Maybe not today, but I would get that patient in to see an electrophysiologist. If it's the saddle pattern I'm pro and they've got no other signs or symptoms of syncope, they have no prior family history of sudden death, they haven't been having syncopal episodes before, the saddle pattern probably is not enough to justify a workup. But the coved pattern, even if that's incidental, most electrophysiologists want to work that up. All right, yep. 60-year-old, so somewhat of an incidental finding, but his brother dropping dead uh, prompted your suspicion. Yeah, good. That's a life saved. That's a life saved, unfortunately. All right, just a few. Yep, I'll take one more question. Sodium to help? Like That's an interesting question. Does sodium help? I, I don't know. I've never seen that studied or, or worked up before. I, I don't know if sodium uh, is necessarily going to help chronically. I mean, normally, when, if they survive and make it to the emergency department, they're usually asymptomatic. They're doing fine. Uh, and so the key thing there is just get them in to see an electrophysiologist. Is a bolus of sodium there in the ED going to help? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure it's necessary because they're not having symptoms when they show up in the emergency department. And if they show up with the polymorphic VTAC, you're going to shock them. You're going to shock them out of it. So a few more patterns up, up here. Again, this is a more subtle pattern, incomplete right bundle. Notice there's a little ST elevation. It's just a little, pretty subtle. But recall, a normal right bundle usually has ST depression in V1 and V2. So if you ever see ST elevation in V1 and V2 with the right bundle, that should stand out as abnormal, especially if it's a post-syncope patient. A couple more cases. Here's incomplete right bundle with ST elevation. This is the saddle type of pattern. This is less sensitive and less specific. I would only work this up if a patient came in with concerning history. They've had syncopal episodes or a family history of sudden death. But if somebody's got this coved pattern, I would, work, I would get this patient in for follow-up even if it's purely incidental. This COVE pattern is really concerning to the EP folks. Again, a couple more very classic COVE type of patterns. There's another one right up there, and yet another one primarily in V1, all right? Here's another one. Again, I'm just trying to really hammer this home. I don't mind if you get bored of looking at these because I never want you to miss this, right? Now, if a patient comes in with ST elevation in V1, V2 with chest pain, this is a STEMI, all right? So the history matters. If they're coming in with chest pain, work them up for STEMI. Or ACS. But if a person comes in post syncope with this pattern, you've got to worry about Brigada. All right? So again, money leads V1 and V2. If you see this, send them to electrophysiology for confirmatory testing and placement of an AICD if it's positive. And you know what? You just saved a life. All right? So, what do you, and interestingly, somebody sent this to me from Nashville. There's a bar called Brigada. I don't know why, but I thought this was worth, worth sharing. And I'm sure this is somewhere in Vegas. I'm not sure where this is from. So, when you get an EKG on a post syncope person, what are you looking for? Everyone's looking for the two no-brainers, ACS and arrhythmias. Look for the two congenital things or genetic things, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and Brugada, both of which about 50% of the time have a family history of sudden cardiac death, all right? What else are you looking for? Well, we talked about this yesterday for the people that were here. This is it's irregularly irregular, so it's AFib, Morphologies are changing, and in some places, extremely rapid. This is AFib with WPW. And the key point we wanted to make yesterday is look for this triad, especially the short PR. In any patient in whom you get an EKG post syncope, you've always got to check the PR. And when you see a short PR, go on a hunt for delta waves. And if you see short PR with delta waves, even in just one lead,
you worry about WPW, and if they came in for syncope, here's your post-syncope WPW EKG. Notice delta waves are not present everywhere. None of these leads have delta waves. So get in the habit of looking for short PRs, and when you see a short PR, even the computer reads a short PR, that's fine. Go looking for the delta waves now, and you'll notice that there's delta waves in a handful of leads. In this case, there's a bunch of leads, but as I mentioned yesterday, I've seen cases where there's only one lead with delta waves. So if all you're doing is looking for delta waves, you'll miss this. Look at the PR, and when you see a short PR, go hunting on all 12 leads for delta waves. So you've got to be on the lookout. And if, they, if you have a WPW patient that comes in with post-syncope, you've got to worry that they had a run of AFib WPW. That's the killer disease, all right? And what do you do for these patients? It's irregularly irregular with morphologies that are changing in size. In some places, it can get extremely rapid. AFib with a bundle doesn't do this. Normal AFib never goes this fast. So if somebody's going this fast and the QRS complexes are changing size and shape, you've got to worry that there's an accessory pathway, get them admitted to the hospital, and never use AV nodal blockers in AFib WPW because it will induce VFib. AV nodal blockers, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, adenosine, dig, amiodarone, those are all AV nodal blockers. They will shunt the, the pulses down the accessory pathway and accelerate the ventricular rate and put them into VFib. So AV nodal blockers are contraindicated. I showed this to you yesterday. This is AFib with no accessory pathway here. This is just AFib with the right bundle. How do you know there's no accessory pathway here? Because the morphologies are pretty much all the same and nowhere are you approaching 250 or 300. Here's AFib with the left bundle. There's no accessory pathway here. Give them whatever you want. How do you know there's no accessory pathway? Because the morphologies are pretty much all the same and nowhere are you approaching 250 or 300. All right, but when you see that extremely rapid rate with morphologies that are changing, you've got to worry about WPW. What do you do? Send them to an electrophysiologist for ablation and stay away from AV nodal blockers if they are presenting with AFib. All right, so what are you looking for on the post syncope EKG? You're looking for the two no brainers ischemia and arrhythmias. You're looking for the two genetic problems, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and brigada, and you're looking for the two intervalopathies. Short PR, in other words, WPW, and the last one, the long QT, all right? Long QT, your machine is pretty good with intervals, and so this is the one part of the EKG read that's usually pretty good. So be on the lookout for the long QT. I think people are pretty savvy about this already. There's a lot of medications that prolong the QT. Where do you get the QT from? Your computer will calculate it for you. If you really have nothing better to do, you can calculate it yourself using the Bazette formula. Sometimes these cardiologists that are very purists will say, oh, you should be calculating the QT all yourself. And your response should be <laughs> either get a life or you can simply say, if you accurately want to calculate the QT, what you're supposed to do is use the Bazette formula in three consecutive impulses in three contiguous leads and average the nine numbers. Or you can simply use your machine's QT calculation. All right, I'll go with the latter. Now, how long is too long? Actually, 500. When the QTC gets over 500, that's when we really need to worry. If it's 470, 480, usually it's not a problem. 490, I don't worry about it as much. But once the QTC gets over 500, that's when you start worrying that the patient's have, gonna be at risk for developing torsade. All right, now, some interesting cases here. This is a patient that I took care of. It was, I was doing a three to 11 shift. When they came and they dropped this, it was about 10.50 p.m. And they came and they dropped this chart into my rack. And I thought, oh, I was just about getting ready to clean up and leave. Usually a three to 11 shift means I'm gonna leave around midnight. So I saw this EKG and I looked at the triage note. It actually had a kind of a red flag. This, uh, it was a psych patient, it said patient is somnolent and suicidal patient is faking syncope. So I thought, well, that's a little unusual, even for our psych patients. So I thought, you know, I told the tech, we should probably get an EKG. So I said, we need to get an EKG. Take your time, take at least 10 minutes to get that EKG. He comes back two minutes later, gives me this EKG. Dr. Matu, I've got an EKG for you. So I look at this and I'm thinking, well, looking at my watch, there's kind of a lot of artifact down here. You know, I think we probably ought to get a better baseline 12 lead. Take at least 10 minutes to get it. 
He comes back two minutes later and says, Amal, I've got a better bass line for you. Here it is. <laughs> so, so, I said, so I said to him, what was the patient doing when you got this 12 lead? He said, she was faking syncope. No, no, she, was, she, wasn't, she wasn't faking syncope. She was trying to die. Um, so she was going in and out of torsad. Here's a patient with AG is acute gastroenteritis. Gastroenteritis can throw your electrolytes off and prolong your QT, so be careful about that. They can develop torsad as this patient did with gastroenteritis. Imagine that. She was on a monitor, so we got to it quickly. Um, alcoholics always have prolonged QT due to hypomag and hypo K. All right, so be on the lookout for that as well. And then patients with seizures, always check a 12 lead on patients with first time seizure because every now and then seizures are actually not caused by the brain, they're actually caused by arrhythmias. And this patient had seizures while on the monitor and every time it was precipitated by torsade. So when a patient has prolonged QT, they can go into torsade, hypoperfuse the brain, fall to the ground and shake. That's not a brain problem, that's a heart problem. And there's countless case reports of patients that were misdiagnosed through the years as having seizure problems when in reality, they simply had prolonged QT, all right? If you encounter prolonged QT, look for the underlying cause and treat the underlying cause, shock them if they're in torsade. I love this, dihydrogen monoxide, isn't that just water, right, H2O? Kind of sounds a little bit scary. All right, and so <laughs> this was kind of interesting. This is supposed to say, <laughs> Pen is broken, please use finger. <laughs> uh, Got to watch the spacing there. All right. So last point, just to recap. When you get an EKG on a post syncope patient, what are you looking for? Two no-brainers, ischemia and arrhythmias. Two genetic problems, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and Brigada, and two intervalopathies, short PR, in other words, delta wave or uh, WPW, and prolonged QT. All right, look for that prolonged QTC. Um, I'm a bit over time, so I'll take questions at the break. I want to hand things over to Amr. And uh, again, thanks for your attention, but I'll be around for any questions. Right. Thank you.